Our next presenter is Ethan Harstead, and his talk will be on the online ballooning portal. Ethan? All right. Um, so, first of all, is what is the portal? Um, we're envisioning this as an all inclusive, start to finish, even after finish uh, tool that's all online. You can start with planning, proceed through prediction, tracking your balloon in real time, uh, analyzing the data after it's done, exporting the data, storing the data, sharing the data with colleagues or even uh, first time balloonists that are you know, looking for some data to convince department chair to fund them or something like that. Um, why are we doing this? A uh, few of you probably at the 2012 conference in uh, Treveca. Um, one of the things that we had a breakout session about was um, sharing data, um, keeping that in a central repository. Uh, so that's one of the main reasons why this came from. But that was obviously just storing data. We're like, well, why don't we just integrate the whole system? Uh, one of the other things that we have seen somewhat alarmingly often is beginners who will do a flight prediction and then they'll be all excited, or they'll launch a balloon, be all excited about it, and then people on the mailing list will rip on them because, oh, you didn't do a flight prediction. And they're like, well, it was too tough. And like, well, it's, it might look tough, but it's not actually that tough. But a lot of that just comes down to perceived difficulty, even though it's not actually too difficult. It just looks difficult. Um, the other benefits are we can uh, share data to fill gaps and uh, provide examples to new people. And then one huge thing for uh, future ballooning is uh, collecting all this data allows us to start doing statistical modeling on um, the ascent profiles, descent profiles, stuff like that. Um, when you start getting into it, it's, it's pretty complicated to actually model the drag of a balloon due to Reynolds number effects, stuff like that. I'll talk about that a little later. Um, so just kind of to start out with, we identified some basic objectives. Um, Later on, we want to invite the community to contribute future requests, stuff like that, so that we can, we want this to be free and available to everyone through uh, the SBA. So we welcome your input on this. But these were our initial objectives, um, which we want the tracking or the uh, prediction system to be simple for beginners to use, but also have advanced options for stuff like zero pressure, float. Um, you know, a lot of people do are experimenting with different flight profiles, so we don't want to rule out any of that. We want our tracking system to be as wide ranging as we can, so stuff like the uh, digi extends modems that a lot of people fly, APRS that even more people probably fly. Um, we want storage to just be bulletproof. You don't even have to think about it. Your data is just there. Uh, sharing, again, we want that to be really easy, like just wiki or something like that. Um, and then data presentation. Obviously, it's more useful if you know what it means, like looking at spreadsheets, not really all that intuitive, especially for newer people. So visual aids are always a plus. And finally, we want it to be open source and community-driven development. So these are a few of the existing tools that I'm sure a few of you have used. Nearspace Ventures, I'm sure some of you used that a while ago. That's no longer online. Uh, HabHub seems to be pretty popular. A new one, which we've been using for a while, but apparently not too many people have heard of yet, is the, the Astra system. And then there's APRS FI, Open APRS, APRS based websites for that, and SpaceNear is another popular tracker. So we're going to look at each of those now. Um, this is the HabHub predictor. This is um, from UK HASS. Uh, this one actually is open source, which is nice. Um, again, it looks fairly complicated. I mean, it's there's not really much guidance. You have to, um, entering in your balloon parameters is a little bit troublesome because they have some limits on payload size. And because, again, it's UK, and those guys <laughs> usually don't fly 12 pound payloads like we do. Uh, they're usually much lighter. Um, and just, it's somewhat problematic. And you can literally just enter in your burst altitude. I don't know a lot of people that just intuitively have a notion of burst altitude. But um, this is the one that we usually hear people tried to use and got kind of turned off by it. This is Astra, which actually, if you can see, one of the new features that they have is they will actually do a Monte Carlo simulation and give you kind of an ensemble prediction like you see here. Um, this actually was, if we would have launched this morning, uh, 
So you can see there's, this should be uh, 10 different flight paths. Um, they vary things like ascent rate, burst altitude, they'll vary the wind model a little bit just to try and get you a better estimate of uh, where your balloon could land, you know, not just in theory, but in practice. They'll, there's usually one that's really long and there's a couple short ones for early bursts, stuff like that. And I mean, it looks a little bit better, but when you start drilling through all the options, there's stuff like, I don't know how many of you have heard of something like train equivalent sphere diameter. <laughs> Doesn't really mean a lot to most people. Um, and especially when you get into the simulation settings, there's some options you can play with, like float and stuff like that. Um, but this one actually seems to be even more accurate than the UK has one and is picking up in use. As you, they also have uh, a hydrogen option, which is nice. Um, as far as tracking goes, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. Um, APRS.fi, pretty common, APRS-based tracking. Obviously, you run into the limits that you have to be eye-gating it, so either you're eye-gating it yourself from your own base station or a cell phone, or you're running national APRS, which limits your data rate, because DigiPeter owners will yell at you if you transmit five-second packets on their repeaters. Um, so this one is also from the UK Has guys, and if you can see, each one of these little radio tower icons here, is act they actually have a distributed listener network. A lot of this is because they can't use amateur radio on their balloons, so they have, they have to run ISM and use really low power. Um, so you can see this, this is a flight that was going on, I believe, yesterday. That's when I grabbed this, the picture anyways. Um, so actually, there's three different balloons going on right here. There's one in there, that mess, another one there, and this one over here. And this system is actually really nice. It's just kind of a pain to use because you've got to get in touch with an admin of the site to get a user account to be able to add a payload definition. And you've got to know what those parameters are and then you've got to install their software and get that all configured. Um, so this is what we'd like to do, um, especially with the distributed li listener network would be really nice. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but this site, as you're flying, each packet that comes in, they'll run a new prediction. So they'll give you a landing site. It'll track your recovery vehicles, really anything that you add to it. Um, so this is really our starting point for what our baseline performance for a tracker would be. So none of these systems really have data storage. Um, you can kind of download some data from APRS.fi, but they're kind of picky about it. You can only do so many data points a day unless you pay them. Uh, none of them really have graphing. Uh, APRS.fi will do a little bit if you put your telemetry into your APRS string, and then really none of them can share it all. So again, what we're looking for is a start to finish solution. So our proposed solution consists of several steps. Um, Obviously, you enter in what you think your mass will be, what size balloon, all that stuff. And then um, we actually have a server that we're downloading all the global forecast data for the entire forecast period. So right now, we can go out to 28 days, but that's questionably useful. So we typically limit it to about 18. So once you enter your initial parameters, it'll actually do a rough prediction for you for couple times a day out through the entire forecast period. So you can say, hey, well, Tuesday of next week is looking pretty good. Um, so then once you've picked a day, um, I'm sure some of you are members of like the RHAB mailing list or balloon skid or anything like that where people <coughs> announce their flights. Um, we'd love to have something like that for SBA. So when you schedule a flight, you'll have the option to add it to the announcement list, and people will automatically be notified. They'll get your payload parameters, tracking parameters, all that. Another option we'd really like to have is generating like an FAA call sheet or sheet that you can fax to them. Different offices want faxes, some want emails, some want phone calls, whatever. And then all current flights will be posted on the website, so anyone can just be like, well, I wonder what balloons are in there right now. Click that, and there you go. So then uh, the next step, obviously, would be once you've launched a balloon, you need to track the balloon. Um, we have a couple different software packages that you can install, and they automatically upload any data that you receive. Uh, 
that goes to the website. The website will do a live prediction, and you can see where it's going to land, and you can see the uncertainty get smaller as the flight goes on. And again, you can generate you know, your 60,000 foot exit, your 60,000 foot entrance, paperworks, and view any telemetry that you're up uploading in live graphs. So once the balloon's landed, you, know, you want to save that data. So you can select and export data. You can plot it, generate reports, anything like that. But the big thing that we'd really like to do is, uh, obviously, since you're uploading your data and we're doing live predictions, we want to see how accurate the prediction was. That comes in very crucial when you're doing statistical modeling. So we can analyze how accurate our model was, see what types of flights the model wasn't accurate, so we can identify those and try and tweak our model to make those more accurate. And then, obviously, we want data sharing, so there'll just be ways to um, access other prior flight data. You can mark your data as private if you want, stuff like that. And then, um, uh, say if you've got an experiment in mind, and you want to see, well, I wonder if anyone's done this. Like, say, one of the ones that keeps coming up is like cosmic rays. You can be like, oh, has anyone done a cosmic ray flight? And since each payload will be tagged as what the telemetry is, you can just come up with a list of flights that have flown cosmic ray sensors, see their data, you know, this many counts at this altitude. Some of them even have like orientation information, stuff like that, uh, which would be very useful for uh, planning future experiments. Um, so some of the current work that we've done is uh, HiveTK is a Java package that runs locally. It's not online yet. We're working on uh, bringing that online. Um, it already does the bulk predictions, so you can say, well, this is my payload weight, this is my balloon, this is my lift, and it will give you the next two weeks of flights, and you can pick out which one works best. Um, it does track live and does real-time predictions. Um, like this here is a screenshot of two weeks of potential launches from Ames from a year back or so. Um, as you can see, there's some pretty wide variations in uh, over the couple of weeks. Um, another tool that was actually, development of that was um, funded by uh, the NSF through Taylor uh, is Stratocast. This actually is online right now. Um, has a couple of issues, but we're actively working on it. There should be an update in the next week or so. Um, and this is very simplified. Um, we wanted it to be simple to use. Uh, it has guided wizards and tool tips to help you figure out what everything means. Uh, we'll do reverse predictions, um, which is very useful for some people that have to drive a long ways to, like, oh, we can't launch from our university because we'll land in a lake. Um, that's actually been used a couple of times that I'm aware of where they, we want to land somewhere near this city, and they'll, it'll tell you where you have to drive out and what time you need to launch it at. And then this is also um, one of the driving factors was for this to be able to be used in like middle school, high school. Um, so apparently, a lot of those teachers want to be able to do this on like iPads, stuff like that. So that was another driving factor. Uh, this was another, this is if we were to launch this morning um, or sometime. I don't know. It's from Grand Forks, at any rate. As you can see, it's a pretty simple interface. Just list your relevant parameters here. You step through a wizard to define uh, what your flight is. And then a lot of work is going on behind the scenes that you really can't see any pr uh, progress on because it's just very, very back end and doesn't really do anything until we start implementing it. But uh, the biggest one of this is the requirements definition and standards development. We really don't want to just start developing willy-nilly. We want to see what has already been done, what of that can be integrated into a, a uh, all-in-one solution. And we'd like to have standards so that interoper interoperability becomes much simpler. Um, so if any of you have done um, nano-satellite work, stuff like that, uh, you might have come across the CCSDS, which is Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems. They actually have so many standards. They have uh, interoperability standards, data definition standards, tele telemetry, telecommand, description, stuff like that. So we would like to integrate these systems into our framework. Um, one benefit from that would be you could act, if you're using this on a CubeSat, which is becoming more and more common, 
you can actually just literally fly that and it'll talk to our system. And then when you're in space, you didn't have to change anything. We're also working on uh, different prediction stuff. Um, a lot of the predictors out there, especially the online ones, just say, well, what's the nearest sounding at the nearest time? And then they don't really take into account, you know, if the winds are changing. Like if you, we always will do a prediction for when we want to launch and then the three hours before that, three hours after that, because that's when the sounding interval is. And see, oh, if we're, if we're late getting that balloon off the ground, it's going to be an extra 20 miles. Um, so we now interpolate between different time periods and over the <coughs> lat longitude grid. And then float and zero pressure stuff. Um, in the future, we want to start integrating atmospheric modeling, uh, performance evaluation, stuff with machine learning uh, to help our predictions become more accurate. And then, as we mentioned before, we'd lo really love to do a distributed tracking network. Um, so this is just some space grant schools that uh, I was pretty sure would be here. And this is just with a mild 300 mile range circles, which you'll have 300 mile radio horizon at like 45,000 feet. It's really not that tough. And I'm assuming you can track your own balloon until it's at 45,000 feet. Like, you should be able to do that. But this, if you want to do like a long duration CubeSat test flight, you can see you can launch like, we're pretty in a good, pretty good spot. We can launch from Iowa and have coverage almost until it's over the ocean, which would be great. The big thing for this is we need people to be using the same radios, the same telemetry formats, or at least be able to um, handle that on the back end, different uh, telemetry formats. So as I mentioned before, we want this to be community driven. So if you have any future requests, want to help out with planning, programming, user experience design, stuff like how it looks, how the workflow works, anything like that, uh, we're always looking for testers, flight data to feed into our models to uh, analyze how well it works. That's my contact address. Um, you can talk to me, I'll give you a card or anything like that, or talk later. Um, that's it for this. Any questions about anything? Alex? How do you plan on uh, getting the word out beyond our conference? Well, a lot of that will be mailing lists. Um, there's lots of amateur mailing lists. They're very active. Um, we'll have the SBA mailing list, word of mouth, social media, anything really. Matt? Uh, I saw you had the software defined radio. Yeah. Do you have any specific ideas with that? Or? Um, well, one of the big things would be stuff like the, uh, the RTL-SDR dongles. I don't know if many of you have heard of these, but they're literally like $10 USB TV receivers that can tune from like 80 megahertz to 1100 megahertz. Um, really anything that you know the modulation format for, you can quick write a little um, signal flow chart that will demodulate that and there's, you can do the APRS real easily, tons of people have done those. Um, there's some open source radio modems like the RFD900s, that should be easy since we have the firmware for that. Um, stuff like the XB or Extend is proprietary and might be possible but possibly illegal as well. We'll see. <laughs> Don? Yeah. From what you're saying, it seems like this is kind of a work in progress, right? That <coughs> prediction is something that we can do and, you know, can do relatively well, but can, there, there can be improvements or added features mm -hmm. to be able to do it better. But there's also see that there's a need for it right now. So you have kind of two things. You're, you're developing this, but at any given point, it would be nice for just to be person who doesn't know that much, who doesn't have that much, or doesn't want to give it too much, can use it and get a good prediction or whatever they want to do. So it seems like there's kind of like two challenges. One is to begin to continue to, to move it along so it gets better and better and better, have more and more features, but also have maybe not the most recent thing available, but, but maybe something available that is easy to use and you know all the bugs have been worked out so that they can use that. Is that, am I? Yeah. What I'm saying is that, am I making sense to you? Would you yeah. That? We actually have two servers running right now. We have an alpha and a beta server. Um, not in the conventional software. It's 
sense of alpha and beta, it's just what we named them. Where um, we'll be running a well-tested version on one server and the development version on the other one. Um, and we want to make a lot of the improvement stuff automated through like machine learning and uh, you can automatically characterize which flights fit well, which didn't mark them for human review, stuff like that. But yeah, it's definitely, we'll, we'll probably need two separate, we'll, we'll have you know, a live or master and then a development version, but even in the live version, we're planning to probably have like a wizard based, like a fuse, like look at it like uh, graphs, like Excel has the chart wizard, which is great if you don't really know what you want to do and you can just click through stuff and get results. Or you can go like the MATLAB approach where you know what you're doing and say this is exactly what I want. We'll probably have two tracks that you can choose, like a guide me through this or a I know what I'm doing, just let me input numbers version. So it sounds like maybe the challenge for SBA is to be able to um, have, have, have a version that's the one that's pretty standard, yeah. easy to use. The simplified get the word version. Word out and get people to be using that. Anybody can use it. Then also for those of the real geeks that mm -hmm. want to improve this and make it better, <laughs> that's another avenue of hey, but this we want to improve this. And we want people to be involved. Exactly. The, the biggest thing is feedback, feedback, feedback. We just need lots of feedback. And I mean, kind of difficult at someone who's done a lot of balloons to sit down and be like, oh, well, this is all a beginner should need. And then you don't realize, oh, well, they don't really necessarily know what everything means. Uh, James? Here's some feedback. Uh, <laughs> I, I like the idea. It never occurred to me to try and do predictions for two weeks at a time. And I've never done business that way. But I would definitely be much more interested in where would I have to launch from to land it at the same spot as opposed to having all the launch sites be identical. That's just, that, that has no meaning to me. I never go back to the same launch site twice, but I do always aim for the same landing site, so that would be much more useful to me. Yeah, that really shouldn't be too difficult to do, and just be swapping out the uh, forward predictor for the reverse predictor in the, uh, the uh, I forget what we're calling it, but the, uh, the uh, large ensemble predictor. That really shouldn't be too hard to do. Yes. Are you, with your plate prediction, do you, you use just the sounding, or does it actually bring in the forecast data? Um, I'm kind of using the term sounding loosely. Um, the, they call the, the uh, forecast, we're using forecast data. We're downloading, um, right the, at the moment, we're using the one degree grid GFS data. Um, up, that's like 28 altitude levels at a one degree latitude longitude grid. Um, and then interpolating over time through that with cubic interpolation, and or actually doing tricubic over horizontal and time, and then you know using the proper exponential interpolation for uh, pressure and stuff like that. So you're doing all that? Yeah. It's well. This is what well, must be three, four years. We basically took our offline program and moved that online into a server backend. So it's had some time to develop. You say it's open source? Yes, this is all on GitHub. Um, uh, if, if you search for HiveTK, you'll find that. Uh, if you search for Stratocast, you'll find that one as well. Stratocast one is has a very big rewrite coming very soon. <laughs> but And that's the offline one's Java. The, the online one is a mixture of JavaScript and Python. Alex? Uh, do you have a timeline for where this would all be one website? Um, basically, it depends on uh, how many different tracking backends we want. I have APR, the APRS backend ready for testing, where we'll just literally pull the APRS uh, IS backbone for anything that has a balloon icon, and it'll track it and do predictions for it if it has data. So in that regard, are you, are you going to do A for spy? Is that who you're going to pull? Uh, we're actually pulling direct from the APRSIS backbone network. I'm not familiar with that. We tried doing the Find You site mm -hmm. and uh, got shut down. Yeah, the, the APRSFI site has an API. It's a little bit limited, and especially in request rate, you can only request new status updates like every 15 seconds or something like that. We're just going direct. Um, 
the, the backbone that those sites are pulling from. Um, it's a lot of data, but if you've got a server that can handle it, it's really not too bad. For tracking, are you planning to stick with the amateur APRS, or are you looking at maybe something else that's um, to add to it or something to add some other yeah, we want to support, support as many as we can. Um, right now, we're doing APRS for sure. We're going to have a little program that you can download if you're using basically anything that goes over a serial port. You can probably use it with the system. Um, looking to test Iridium shortly because that's all IP-based, which should be fairly simple. 